This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, here, as you can see in Chapter 16, we are introduced to corporation tax. We're going to look at the basis of chargeability of corporation tax within this chapter and how it is that we present a corporation tax computation. We're used now to tax computations and what they do. They assemble, of course, all of, as it has been so far, income of the individual or capital gains of the individual. We assemble and establish a figure of what is taxable. Taxable income, taxable gains. Here, of course, we'll be computing for a company what will be its taxable total profits. A figure that will be made up of a combination of two distinct areas. We're going to have the sources of taxable income for the company, most notably, and for most companies, of course, the only source being its trading income. And that's where much of your time will be spent in terms of this chapter. But what we also have, as we saw on our introduction to capital gains tax for individuals, is the fact that companies do not pay CGT. What they do is to pay corporation tax on their capital gains. So the corporate tax computation is going to combine both the sources of taxable income, mostly trading. We could have other forms of taxable income as well. We could have interest income, we could have property income, similar indeed to what we have for an individual. What you will see, however, or maybe it would be truer to say what you won't see, is dividend income. When a dividend is received by a company from another company, paid out of its tax profits, that dividend is not further charged to corporation tax again in the hands of the recipient company. So we won't be seeing dividend income here. But this is an introduction to the uh, first chapter that uh, we have on chapter 16 here, the introduction to corporation tax. And because basically the principles of the preparation of the corporate tax comp and the periods for which it is prepared hasn't changed. So in this first of two lectures in chapter 16, we will be using the Finance Act 2020 lecture. Because as I have said, there are no rule changes that have taken place. What we will see is they'll talk about, or I will talk about indeed in the uh, lecture from Finance Act 2020, about a corporate tax rate having at, set at a steady rate of 19% over the last several financial years. And that has continued with a corporate tax rate remaining at 19% for financial year 2021. There is a new term, a financial year, so far as a, a co company is concerned, but in a corporate tax context, all of which will be explained to you, the definitions that you need to know to establish the period for which a corporate tax computation will be prepared, and the basis of taxing the profits in that computation, all of that will be forthcoming in that lecture. But the corporate tax rate has remained at 19%. So when I talk to you in the lecture for Finance Act 20 about the recent financial years and the corporate tax rate being 19%, that is happily continued on into what is relevant for us, our financial year 2021. In Chapter 16.2, again, most of this is the Finance Act 2020 lecture. But there is going to be a new insert into there that has to be done in relation to capital allowances. There's a newly recorded insert for the capital allowances section. What used to be the case was there was only a slight differentiation between how you prepared a capital allowance computation for the unincorporated trader and how we did that for the incorporated trader. And that difference still remains and it will be dealt with in that lecture. But what has happened for a two-year period at least, starting with our financial year 2021, we have some new so-called enhanced capital allowances. That's going to allow far bigger capital allowances available to companies than would be available to unincorporated traders, and which are only going to be around for a couple of years, but will be a boost for companies most especially larger companies, in terms of the capital expenditure that they incur, a way by which the government can stimulate capital expenditure and growth when, of course, they wish to do so. 
That, of course, is off the backdrop of what has happened with the pandemic over the last two years. So we have, just for a two-year period, this is the first of those two years now for you, uh, looking at the uh, exams from June 22 through to March 23, we have this system of enhanced capital allowances. And what that will allow is, in fact, what we might think is incredibly enhanced, that in relation to, say, a £100,000 expenditure in terms of routine plant machinery purchased by a company for an, within an accounting period, that we would be able to claim 130%. Yeah, more than we spent, 130%. It's known as a super deduction. Indeed, it's truly super. So we've got that enhanced capital allowance there, and also in relation to special rate pool expenditure, whereby anything that goes over and above the normal 100% AIA that is available, still with the same £1 million cap, of course, in relation to the AIA limit for a 12-month accounting period. But in addition to that, instead of then the balance of such special rate pool expenditure that might exceed £1 million, instead of that just being a writing down allowance of 6%, now, and again, just for this short period, We've got the ability then to claim on the balance above 1 million, where we've had the 100% AIA, and now get a 50% first year allowance. So we've got some new first year allowances coming in. The super deduction of 100% on routine plant and machinery, what would otherwise routinely have been main pool expenditure. Instead of 100% AIA, we're going to get 130% super deduction in the form of a one off first year allowance. And in relation to special rate pool expenditure, should we go above the £1 million limit, which gives us 100% AIA, the balance is not going to be just a 6% annual writing down allowance, but in that first year, we'll get a 50% first year allowance. We won't also get a WDA, that will be available from the next accounting period onwards. But some huge increases there in the capital allowances that are potentially available to companies, most notably those incurring larger amounts of expenditure on plant machinery. And the whole idea, of course, of the system was to induce companies to spend in relation to that in what has been a difficult time for businesses, of course. We've given tax encouragement for growth there at a time when it is needed. So firstly, in chapter 16.1, it will be the same lecture as before, but note for, for the financial year 2021 that will mostly concern us, we still have a 19% standard rate of corporate tax. When you come to 16.2, you will see mostly the Finance Act of 2020 lecture again, but sandwiched in between a newly recorded part that will deal with the new system of capital allowances for companies within the corporate tax system. Well, having focused our attention up until now on personal taxation dealing with individuals, we turn our attention to corporate tax and the taxation of companies. Now, when looking at personal tax, very specifically income tax, there was a number of chapters that dealt with the unincorporated trader. And some, not all, of what we learned there is gonna be relevant to you here. Let me remind you, back in chapter four, we discovered that in, when dealing with an unincorporated trader, that the tax adjusted trading profit is the profit that would form the basis of assessment for then the relevant tax year. So we had to go through a process of taking the accounting profit, the bottom line net profit as per the statement of profit or loss, and adjusting that for taxation purposes. Now that involved a procedure whereby we would add back to that accounting net profit all of the non-allowable expenses for taxation purposes and we would deduct anything that was either not assessable as trading income such as property income or interest income for example they have their own path towards the income the personal tax computation we would establish that tax adjusted trading profit adding back non-allowable expenses taking away non-trading income and also taking away one very important uh, figure as well. And that was the figure of capital allowances. 
the best known of the addbacks for non-allowable expenses has been and no doubt always will be the addback of depreciation of our plant and machinery. And instead, we get a formal system by which Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, God bless them, that they will give tax relief for qualifying capital expenditure incurred by a business. Now, in terms of those two areas, Chapter 4 dealt with the adjustment profits, Chapter 5 dealt with capital allowances, and the way in which tax relief would indeed be given for qualifying capital expenditure, principally, and up until, indeed, the 2021 tax year, that would be uh, uh, dealing with the plant machinery that was bought during a period. What we've also now got to turn our attention to is, of course, that structures and buildings allowance, whereby qualifying property that is bought by a business may indeed rank for that structures and buildings allowance. And probably, if you're going to see that tested as well you may, given it's new to the syllabus for the 2021 exams, uh, if you're going to see it tested, it probably would be in the context of a larger business, i.e. a company. All right. Now, thankfully, we don't have then many of the problems that attach to income tax. How was it that we related an accounting period for a particular unincorporated trader, be it a sole trader or a partnership, to then the tax year for which the income tax computation would be prepared, and therefore that profit would be charged to tax on the individual unincorporated trader, or of course the partner there within a partnership. When it comes to dealing with corporate tax, life is much easier. We already know the vast majority of what you need to know to determine a tax-adjusted trading profit. There are just a few differences that we'll talk about very shortly in terms of the adjustment of profit process and also the capital allowances system. And if anything, these, those differences actually make it easier. You won't, for example, here have to deal in corporate tax in either adjustment of profits or the capital and computation with private use by a proprietor. There isn't a proprietor. There is no private use issue when dealing with your corporate tax. That is purely personal tax, income tax that you have that problem. So if anything, it's going to be easier. Before we look at that corporate tax computation, there's three basic definitions that we need to understand that will then underpin the knowledge that we need to go about preparing that corporate tax computation in the correct manner. Now, those definitions are to be found here at the beginning of Chapter 16. First of all, before those definitions, we just set the scene for who we're dealing with. And we're going to be dealing with companies that are resident in the UK. A UK resident company will be liable upon its worldwide income and gains. And that those income and gains worldwide, not that overseas are going to be an issue here for us in our syllabus, but those worldwide income and gains will be subject to one tax, corporation tax. So there you see another simplification as compared to personal tax. Individuals were charged to income tax on their income and to capital gains tax, EGT, on the chargeable gains, both of which were related in their own separate computations to a given period the tax year. Here, we don't have separate charges to tax in relation to income and gains of companies. A company will prepare a corporate tax computation upon which we will include its worldwide income and gains. There will be one figure of tax to compute, corporate tax charged on the entirety of, again, that worldwide income and gains. Now, I said that's relevant for a UK resident company. And as you'll see here, in relation to a basic definition of a UK resident company, always the possibility you could get a, an objective testing question, a section A question, that tests, tests out this particular issue. A company will be determined to be UK resident. It will be UK resident here. That's got it working. If it is either 
Now, the obvious one, and the main one that you'll see in exam question after exam question, is that the company in question was incorporated in the UK. So, its name here, it could be Company A, A Limited. If it's again got that epithet, that title Limited, or in larger rather entities, PLC, then if it's A Limited or VPLC, then it is incorporated in the UK. That makes it UK resident, and that means it will be liable on its worldwide income and gains, and therefore will be required to prepare a corporation tax computation for, as we'll discover in a moment, its relevant accounting period. Having said that, what you're likely to see, certainly in any uh, uh, computational question, is either A Limited or VPLC, as we've mentioned there, you may find, and it is within the syllabus and it is in this in real life, that you could have a company that was incorporated overseas. So it could be A Inc, which is incorporated overseas. But although it is incorporated overseas, if it is centrally managed and controlled from the UK, then it will still be classified as being a UK resident company. So there's two tests in terms of UK resident so far as a company is concerned. If it's incorporated in the UK, it's UK resident. If it's non-UK incorporated, but it is centrally managed and controlled from the UK, it is still UK resident. In both cases, a corporate tax computation will be required. So what do we mean by central management and control? And for that, we're talking about where the majority of its directors are resident in the UK and board meetings are held within the UK. If that central management and control is being exercised from the UK, as it will be in terms of board decisions being made at board meetings held within the UK, then it is UK resident. So either way means that such a company will then be subjected to corporation tax. So we need to know how to put that corporate tax computation together and we need to know the basis period for which we will prepare that corporate tax computation. And this is where two at least of the three definitions that you need to know come into place. First of all, what you will be given within any examination question requiring you to prepare a corporate tax computation. You will be given the company's statement of profit or loss just like with an unincorporated trader, where you'd be given the statement of profit or loss. And for the accounting period, as we will discover, and that has a very specific definition in corporate tax that it does not have in income tax, for that accounting period, a corporate tax computation will be prepared. But this is where the first of the three definitions come into play. We look firstly at a period of account. And that, as I've just suggested to you, is the period for which a company prepares its accounts. Now, usually a company will prepare accounts for a period of 12 months. It'll have its normal accounting year end. But there may be circumstances in which that period of account for a company is either shorter or longer. That could happen when it either it first starts to trade, so it might start to trade on the 1st of July and might decide that it likes the 31st of December as its accounting period end date. Then logically what it would do from the 1st of July to the following account, uh, sorry, uh, the following 31st of December, that would be a six month period. So it would prepare its accounts for a six month period of account. Of course, it might think that after a mere six months, it doesn't want to get involved in the preparation of financial statements. So what it may choose to do instead is to run that first period of account, not for six months to its chosen accounting date, the 31st of December, but instead decide to run it for an 18 month period of account to the following 31st of December. So the first account, instead of being the six months to the next 31st of December, are 18 months to the following 31st of December. So yes, 
in that opening accounting period, or indeed in its final accounting period when the company ceases to trade, it does not always cease trading on its normal accounting year-end date, then yes, we may find a difference in terms of that period of account being other than 12 months. But the first definition there is sorted. You now know what it is. It is simply what you're given in the question. Here is the statement of profit or loss. Vast majority of the time, that is for the company's accounting year end. It is simply a 12 month period, but in more interesting circumstances, possibly it may either be a short or indeed much more interesting, a long period of account. Now that, as I said, could happen when it first starts to trade, as we've illustrated, when it ceases to trade, or it is at some point in between where it chooses, for whatever reason, to change its accounting date. It might, for example, be taken over by another company, become part of that company's group, and the companies in that existing group don't share the same accounting date as our company, and therefore we're brought into line with the rest of the group. We could change the accounting date. But the company's period of account is simply the period for which the company has prepared its statement of profit or loss. And that takes us to that second and most important definition here. And that is that corporation tax is charged in respect of accounting periods. We will prepare a corporation tox, uh, tax tox, a corporation tax computation for an accounting period. Now, don't worry, because normally a company's accounting period, we'll abbreviate to AP in our notes from now on, will be the same as its period of account. But there is just one situation where the period of account will not be exactly the same as the accounting period. And that is because it cannot exceed 12 months. The corporation tax computation, the accounting period, cannot exceed 12 months. It can be less than 12 months. So if that company starting to trade prepared its accounts for the opening six month period from the 1st of July to the following 31st of December, that six month period of account would become a six month accounting period and the corporate tax computation would be prepared for it. It would then have thereafter year ends the 31st of December, a 12 month, a year end, and the period of account would again always be consistent with that accounting yet with that accounting period but if of course as we also suggested when that company started to trade on the 1st of July and is a chosen 31st of December as its accounting day if it went 18 months to the next the following 31st of December then the period of account would be longer than 12 months and that means that we would not then be able to prepare a single corporate tax computation for that long period of account, that period of more than 12 months. Well, it's not a problem. All we then need to do is to divide that period of account into two separate accounting periods. The first will always be of 12 months and the second will always then be the balance of months. So with an 18 month period from the 1st of July to the uh, then next following 31st of December, you would have, first of all, a 12 month period to the following 30th of June, 12 months on from the start of that period of account. That would be the first accounting period, 12 months to 30th of June. And then the second of your accounting periods would be the balance of that long period of account that would be a further six month period through to then its chosen accounting date of the 31st of December. Now it is that long period account that is more interesting. And we've got, well, an even shorter chapter than this one coming up next in chapter 17, which deals with a long period account. And we simply look at the rules by which when we take what is a statement of profit or loss for a long period, say 18 months, how do we then take that statement of profit or loss and divide it into two corporate tax computations? The first, as we said, being of 12 months and the second, the balance 
of those months of that long period of account. Again, in our example, a six month period, 12 months and six months out of the 18 month period of account. And now before we start taking one statement of profit or loss and splitting it into two corporate tax computations, we'd best see how we take a statement of profit or loss and prepare a single corporate tax computation for it. Something we'll do if ever the period of account is of itself 12 months or indeed is less than 12 months. The period of account becomes the accounting period. Now, as we said, that accounting period is critical. That's the important thing, because it is the period for which the corporation tax computation is prepared. And just like with an income tax computation, uh, where we had to establish for there it was a set period, the tax year, we'd have to establish the taxable income in the first part of the process and then go to the second part of the process to compute either tax liability or move on from tax liability, if there is indeed a difference, to tax payable. So calculating what is chargeable to tax and then computing the tax thereon. So we've got our period for which the corporate tax computation is prepared. It is the accounting period. And for that period, we will establish the taxable total profits or TTP, as we'll know the taxable total profits to be from now on. That will be computed. And if, as we've said, the period of account exceeds 12 months, then two corporate tax computations will be required. The first, 12 months, it cannot exceed 12 months, so it stops after 12 months. And the second for the remainder of that period. And that, as we'll see in, well, not too long from now, comes up in the next chapter, chapter 17. Now that's the two critical definitions. Given in the question is the statement of profit or loss, that is the period of account. From it in our answer, we prepare the corporate tax computation for the accounting period. Nine times out of ten, it will be the same as the period of account. Only if that period of account is longer than 12 months will we have an issue and have to divide it into two corporate tax computations, two accounting periods. But of course, once you've established the taxable total profit for your accounting period, we then need to charge that to tax. That is the figure, hence its name, taxable total profit. It is the figure to be taxed. Now, this is a whole lot easier now than probably it's been in a very long time. And it's always been easier than income tax, where you've got a variety of different tax rates that are not just progressive, that the bigger the income of the individual, the higher the tax rate gets as you move through basic higher to additional rate. And indeed, you then had differential tax rates for different types of income, split between non-saving, savings and dividend income. We don't have any of that problem here in corporate tax. We have a single rate of corporate tax that is imposed on the entirety of its taxable total profit. And remember that that TTP includes not just its income, but also its gains. So a single figure of tax to compute, but using a single tax rate, we'll see that to be 19% indeed for any of the financial years that we need to deal with. But I use there that third definition that we need to know about a financial year. Because it is in relation to a financial year that HMRC set the rate of corporate tax. Now, you will have to know this, you won't have to go back anywhere near that far, but back in the uh, good or bad old days, there was differing rates of tax depending on how big and what size of profits a company had. That disappeared some time ago. But every year in the budget, then the Chancellor of the Exchequer has the ability to change the corporate tax rate. Well, for the last three financial years, as we'll see in the next note here, that has remained the same. And what that means is that the, although the financial year is cast in stone in terms of its dates, as we'll see here, the tax rates to be used for the financial years 
financial years run from the 1st of April through to the following 31st of March. And we don't give them double barrel names like we have for income tax or fiscal years, like the 2020-21, the 2021 tax year. These are denoted by reference to the year in which they start. Hence, financial year 2020 began on the 1st of April 2020. It will therefore run for the next 12 months through to the 31st of March 21. And clearly, therefore, FY19 began on the 1st of April 19 and will run to the 3rd of, well, it ran to the 31st of March 2020. And what we have is not just FY2020 that we need to be aware of at FY19, but so far as our syllabus extends, going back as far as FY18, thankfully, the rate of corporation tax has stayed the same, 19%. Now, what that means is, as we all know, a company is able to choose whatever accounting date it wishes to use. It may even, at a future point in time, change that accounting date. The financial year, however, runs from a very set date, 1st of April to following 31st of March. So not all companies, though you will see this in most exam questions, but not all companies will choose the 31st of March as their accounting year-end date, i.e. that being synonymous with the financial year. So a year-ended 31st accounting year-end, 31st of March 21, would mean that we have a very simple outcome, though I think all the outcomes are going to be simple from now on. But if a company prepared its statement of profit or loss for a year-ended 31st of March 21, there, its statement of profit or loss, that is its period of account. Does that period exceed 12 months? No, it doesn't. It's a year end, 31st of March 21. So, the period of account becomes the chargeable accounting period. So, we're going to have to prepare a corporate tax computation and establish the TTP, the taxable total profit of the company, for that given period. The accounting year ended 31st of March 21. And when we've got that TTP, we will establish that that profit made in that accounting period was all made in the year ended 31st of March 21. That is all within one financial year, as we've just seen, FY20. And therefore, just one rate of tax, the one applicable entirely to FY2020, would be applicable. And that, of course, is 19%. But it wouldn't matter... If you had a year ended the 31st of December of 2020, where that spans two financial years, had there been differentials in tax rates, it wouldn't have been difficult, but it would have been a further problem. You'd have had to split that year ended 31st of December between two financial years, the one in which it started and the one in which it ends. That would be three months in one, nine months in another financial year for a year ended 31st of December. But that is not an issue any longer because we just have that single rate of tax that has not now changed for the last three financial years. And if we go forward into the future, at least so far as the, uh, the future as we see it for the next round of exams, from June 21 through to March 22 there, then it's going to be just one single rate of tax, 19% to apply to its TTP, and it won't matter what that accounting date is, because whether it's all in one financial year, year ended 31st of March, or it is partly in one, partly in another, year ended 31st of December, it doesn't matter, because it's always a 19% rate of tax. So that's made life a whole lot easier. Now, in terms of this chapter, we'll look at the content of the corporate tax computation. What makes up that figure of TTP? Having got it, as we know, the battle is won, because all we then need to do is to tax it at 19%, and we've got, if we're required to prepare it, the corporation tax liability. And when you've got that corporate tax liability, 
there's one other thing that in reality the company will need to know, be advised about, and may be required of you in the exam. You'll only do it if it is required of you in the exam. But having established the amount of tax to be paid by the company, the company's going to need to know, so when do we have to pay that? What is the due date? Now that now is the last bit of this particular page of these uh, opening to uh, this chapter. And a company usually has to pay its corporate tax liability. There we go. Nine months and one day after the end of its accounting period. So it's got ample time. It's got nine months and a day after the end of the accounting period to establish the corporate tax computation. So firstly, put its accounts together, get its statement of profit or loss for that period. Establish, therefore, what the TTP is for the period and then pay its tax nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period. But if the company is a large company, large companies are required to make quarterly instalment payments to settle their CT liability. Now, the all the detail on this is contained in a later chapter. In chapter 23, you're uh, that explains on the administrative front how the uh, quarterly instalment payment system works. But if I can give you just a, a simple example here of how that would operate. That if we had the year ended 31st of March 21. So in the question, I repeat, it gave you the statement of profit or loss for the accounting year ended March 21. That was the period of account we would have adjusted up that accounting profit to make it acceptable for taxation. That's what mainly this chapter is all about, to make it acceptable for taxation. And we'd have put that trading profit together with any other worldwide income or gains. We'd put it all together to find the TTP for the accounting period. And that accounting period would also be the year ended March 21. The accounting period here is the same as the period of account. And as long as that company is not large, that it is not large, we'll see a definition of that in a moment's time, then the due date for it to pay its corporation tax liability for that period, nine months and one day after the end of that accounting period. Therefore, that would be the 1st of January 2022. So we'd have nine months and one day to put together our statement of profit or loss, get those financial statements prepared, do the adjustment of profits required to allow us to prepare the corporation tax computation, and then pay the tax, the due date, the 1st of January 22. But if this company was a large company, and again, that is covered in detail, the rules in chapter 23, then it may be required to make quarterly instalment payments. And a large company is a company whose profits exceed 1.5 million. Now that 1.5 million is based on the limit here of 1.5 is used for a single company so we're assuming we're not a part of a group here, with a 12-month accounting period. If you were in a group, that 1.5 million would be divided by the number of related 51% group companies. Again, the definitions of that contained within our chapter 22 on groups, but we'll talk about that a little more in a moment's time. Therefore, divided by the number of related 51% group companies at the end of the immediately preceding accounting period. Now, basically, when we talk about related 51% group companies, companies are related if one is a subsidiary of the other or is the parent company and has a subsidiary, or two or more companies have a common parent company. 
So if we had company A that owned 100% of company V, and they also owned 100% of company F, then those three companies are related. We have A controlling both V and F. V and F are themselves related back to the parent company. So that means there would be three related 51% group companies, assuming that that was the position at the end of the preceding accounting period. Each of those companies would therefore not be using 1.5 million, this profit limit here, but we divide by that number of related 51% group companies, i.e. three, and that therefore would mean it's 500,000. Of course, sometimes you have sub-subsidiaries, and I'm sure some of you would have recognised we're missing a letter here. We can't have A, V and F without company C coming in, and F might own 100% of C, in which case, therefore, we now have four related 51% group companies within the overall A limited or APLC group. So you divide by four. If company C had been acquired part way through this accounting period, then it wouldn't be included, because as we have said here, divided by the number of related 51% group companies at the end of the immediately preceding accounting period. So uh, changes in the group structure for this accounting period will impact on the profit limit of the next period, not for this particular period. If, of course, we have a short accounting period, Remember, you can never have a long accounting period. You can have a long period of account, but it will divide into two accounting periods, 12 months, balance of months. But if we've got a short accounting period, then at profit limit must also be time apportioned for an accounting period of less than 12 months. So if it's a six month accounting period, then you've got six twelfths of 1.5 million, it would be 750,000. If then it was like here, we've got a group of three or four companies, whatever the time apportioned figure of 1.5 million would be for that company, you would then divide out by the number of related 51% group companies. Remember, at the end of the preceding accounting period. And that sets your profit limit. Now then, if we are a large company because we've exceeded the profit limit, in chapter 23, you will learn that for a company to be treated as being large for this period, this current period, and therefore be required to make quarterly instalment payments in relation to this current period, they must have been large in the previous period and must be estimating that they will be large in the current period. Now, this is based on an estimate because we have to start making quarterly instalment pay payments probably, from part way through the current period. We don't wait until the end. That's the whole point about quarterly instalment payments. Obviously, as the quarterly, there's going to be four of them and they start within that accounting period. Based on a full 12 month period, we have the basic rule whereby the first quarterly instalment payment is due on the 14th day of the seventh month from the start of that accounting period. The first inst quarterly instalment payment due the 14th day of the seventh month from the start of the accounting period. So if we've got year ended 31st of March 21, then the first due date in terms of quarterly payments will be the 14th day of the seventh month from the start of that accounting period. Well, that accounting period began on the 1st of April 2020. So that'll be the 14th of October 2020. There is when that would be due. And as there's four of them, 
you would then have the remaining three of the four quarterly installment payments due on a quarterly on a three month basis. So the first one would be the 14th of October of 20. You'd then have the 14th of January 21, and that would then continue to the 14th of April 21. And finally, a final payment due on the 14th of July 21. Look at the difference, therefore, between when you pay your tax. That if you are not a large company, nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period, there it is. It's due the 1st of January uh, 22, based on the year ended March 21. But if you are required to make quarterly instalment payments for this period, they're going to start on the 14th of October of 2020. That's a very, very long time before you would ordinarily pay the tax. So what we'll discover is not only here do we have an administrative rule that needs to be followed, but it's also a planning issue as well. Clearly, we would not wish to have to make quarterly instalment payments if that could be avoided. If we could avoid quarterly instalment payments, it's going to give us a significant cash flow advantage. Rather than having to start making payments the 14th of October 20, we could wait and make a single payment the 1st of January 22. If we can avoid making quarterly instalment payments, if we can avoid being classified as large for this purpose for this period. And that therefore looks at things like, well, how could we reduce profits? We've got to adjust up the statement of profit or loss, the accounting net profit there. Now, you can't mess about with that. You can't pretend that you didn't have income or you've got more allowable expenses than you should. You can't do that. But what you may be able to do, which we look at in Chapter 18, is if we have a loss that's been sustained either by this company or more likely in another company for a particular accounting period, another company within our group, then we will have alternative loss reliefs that will allow us to reduce profits. Now, you saw how in income tax back in chapter seven, was it? Back in chapter seven, I think it was, how you would have a loss made by an unincorporated trader and the differing loss reliefs that could be used and the objectives that we strive to achieve to get the best use out of it. Now, some of those will stand true here. Others will not because we have one thing, we've got a very simple, just a single rate of taxation. There's no differential in tax rates in terms of corporate tax. So one major objective, of course, is cash flow. We don't want to be paying tax sooner than we have to. So loss reliefs will go against profits. The impact of a loss relief going against profits is to reduce those profits. If through the application, the careful application of a loss, we're able to reduce the profit of one or more companies, if it is within a group, below the relevant profit limit for a given accounting period, that will avoid having to make quarterly instalment payments and will give us significant cash flow advantage. But that awaits us in terms of chapter 18 when we look at the basic single company loss reliefs and chapter 22 when we look at loss reliefs applied more interestingly within the relevant group structure that will allow for such group relief of losses. Okay. Now, you've got a little illustration there. Uh, Large Limited prepares its account to the 31st of March in each year. And for the accounting year end, so important to know the period, accounting year ended March 21, it had a TTP of 600,000 and also received dividends. Right, let's just go back and see where we've been talking about profits. Again, back to this note here. A large company is a company whose profits exceed 1.5 million. Now, we need a very specific definition of profit because it isn't necessarily 
just the taxable total profit that up until now you may have assumed it to be. Now, this is a very specific issue here. The profit figures are defined as the TTP of the company plus dividends received, excluding any dividends from related 51% group companies, i.e. subsidiary companies. Now, that tells us something that is also very important in the preparation of the corporate tax computation that we'll be seeing very shortly. And that is that dividend income received by a company is not chargeable income. It's not taxable income. If you think what has happened, when a company pays a dividend, that is coming out of taxed profits. So as we've seen, we will derive a figure of taxable total profit, we'll pay tax on that taxable total profit, and then the dividend will be a distribution out of that profit. It's not an expense in deriving that profit. That dividend paid by the company is going to be paid out of its, again, distributable profits. If that dividend is passed to an individual, then we know that some, maybe not all, but some of that dividend may indeed be chargeable to income tax. And again, differential tax rates, depending on the level of overall taxable income that the taxpayer has. In terms of companies, we're taking a dividend out of a distributable profit made by the paying company. It's paid tax on those profits. Out of the tax profit, it pays the dividend to another company. It's deemed that that company receiving that dividend should not also be charged to taxation in relation to that dividend. The profits from which that dividend was paid to the recipient company have already been subject to corporate tax. Therefore, we won't tax them again. Now, again, whether we understand the logic of that, taxation is not always based on logic, as you will have seen on many occasions with the various different rules that we have. It is a rule, and like it or not, here we like it, the rule must be applied that dividend income is exempt from corporation tax. It will not be included within TTP, our taxable total profits. So although it is not a part of the profit that is chargeable to tax, here in getting the profit figure to determine are we or are we not a large company, we do include, so we take the TTP and we add in here plus the dividends received from other companies with one exception for our syllabus anyway dividends from related 51 percent group companies we do not include for this purpose dividends received from subsidiary companies there and as we said companies are related 51 percent group companies where one company controls another or two or more companies are both 51% subs of another company. Any dormant companies, if they have been dormant for the accounting period in question, then those are excluded. Okay, so first job, statement of profit or loss, company's period of account, is it 12 months or less, or is it more than 12 months? Do we have to prepare one corporate tax computation or two? Assuming for the moment till we get to the next chapter, it is one corporate tax computation. Then for that computation, we will include worldwide income and gains. But as we have just seen there, and we'll witness shortly in this chapter, <coughs> and when we look at the corporate tax computation in detail, um, Dividend income will not be included as a part of TTP. It is exempt from corporation tax. But having got the TTP, charge it to what will be a single 19% corporate tax rate, whatever the date of the accounting period, whatever period end it may have. Then we need to know, or may need to know in an exam question, will need to know in reality, when has that tax got to be paid? 
And as, the long, as long as the company is not classified as large for this period, then it will simply pay it nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period. But if it is classified as large, that means the details in chapter 23, that we're estimating for this current period, it will be a large company. It was actually a large company in the previous period. Then in those circumstances, we are required to make the quarterly instalment payments based on the estimated corporation tax for the current period. That is obviously a cash flow disadvantage if, for example, by the use of loss reliefs, we are able to move a company from being large to not being large, loss reliefs will reduce profits. There's a choice over which profits we choose to reduce. Just like with income tax with loss reliefs, we could look in the current period, we could carry back, we could carry forward. So choice is involved here. Then we would wish if we could to be able to avoid a company's profits being classified as large and also then being required to make quarterly instalment payments. That would be a significant issue. OK. There you've got illustration one. If therefore, try to uh, avoid looking at uh, this, the answer. Um, again, if you would uh, just please uh, have a little go at what it's saying for you to do there. For the accounting year ending March 21, TTP 600,000 received dividends from a number of companies, including its two wholly owned subsidiary companies. This was its lowest profit recorded in several years. Now, you need to be able to work out whether large limited here is going to be classified as large and therefore be required to make quarterly instalment payments. To begin with, if it had TTP of 600,000 and it's also got dividends from a number of companies, meaning its profit figure for comparison with the profit limit is going to be more than 600,000, we probably still think, well, that's a whole lot short of 1.5 million there. But of course, it's got two wholly owned subsidiary companies. So what do you have to do with the profit limit? OK, just I'll pause at this particular point in time. I'll be back in about one minute. That should be long enough for you to have sorted that problem out for yourself to define whether the company is indeed large or not and therefore whether such quarterly instalment payments would be required. OK, well, hopefully no problems there. As soon as we knew that it had got two wholly owned subsidiary companies and there was no reference to those having been acquired during the current accounting period, so it was that situation at the end of the previous accounting period, then there are three related 51% group companies. The profit limit is divided, therefore, by three. And that means for this 12 month period that we're dealing with, it would now have a profit limit of 500,000. Well, 600,000 is its TTP. On top of that, it has dividend income. Clearly, therefore, the company is going to be large for this period. And therefore, given that this is the lowest profit in recent years, then the profit in the previous period would also, must also have been large. Again, assuming the same status of three related 51% group companies. And on that basis, yes, quarterly instalment payments will be required. The details of which are in chapter 23 for you to have a little read through. You can do that uh, indeed following this lecture if you so choose, or indeed at a later point in time once we've completed all of our corporate tax chapters. But you could look at that to be able to determine the rules of that. What I'd also like you to do before next time is just have a little read through this, obviously revise all that we have looked at today in this lecture uh, about accounting periods and when they start and when they end. Again, there are objective testing questions that give you various, well, four uh, particular scenarios there. And they ask you to say how many of these particular scenarios are going to be either the start of or the end of a preceding account of, a, of an accounting period. So, again, something you need to. It's basically common sense. Have a check through that. And then our next lecture, 
we look at the detail of the corporate tax computation. Before that, what I would advise that you do is to remind yourself, as we said earlier, about the adjustment of profit process, which we looked at in chapter four, albeit that was focused on the unincorporated trader. I'll take you through these notes, which tell you the difference between the adjustment of profit that you did in chapter four for income tax for the unincorporated trader and what you're going to have to do now for the incorporated trader in corporate tax. Uh, also, chapter five, capital allowances there, both for plant and machinery and also for structures and buildings allowance so that we are then able to better understand the content of the corporate tax computation because where will most of its worldwide income come from for a company? From its trading operations, of course. So that adjustment of profit, that capital allowance computation is absolutely paramount. Okay, I look forward therefore to going through that corporate tax computation with you next time.